Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fast tracking session on the Force 90. My name is Jeffrey Hirono, and I am HIV Scotland's policy and research lead. Before we start, um, some housekeeping. Uh, I will be hosting today's session, and I will do my best to ensure that we remain within the allotted time frame, which is approximately one hour. Should anyone have any questions, please feel free to comment. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit your questions and I'll do my best to feed them to our panel during the Q&A portion of the session. You're also very welcome to ask your questions live, in which case let me know through the Q&A function and I will unmute your mic and you can ask your question live. You can also use the chat function also at the bottom of your Zoom screen to discuss the session with your fellow participants or to post links and resources. We will also be recording today's session. So if you do experience any technical difficulties, you will be able to watch, you'll be able to come back and watch the session on demand. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Gilead Sciences and Owen Mumford, who have made the Fast Tracking Scotland Summit possible. Our sponsors have not endorsed, supported, or paid our speakers, nor have they influenced the content of any of the sessions. Okay, so today I'm very pleased to present an exciting lineup of guest speakers. I'd like to introduce Dr. Megan Call, who is the lead epidemiologist at the National HIV Surveillance Team at Public Health England. And she is also the lead for the Positive Voices Surveillance Program, which is a nationally representative HIV patient survey, which aims to understand the experiences and the needs of people living with HIV in the UK. Next, uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Lazarus, Associate Research Professor at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health at Hospital Clinic at the University of Barcelona. There, he leads the Health Systems Research Group. He is also the co-chair of the HIV Outcomes Coalition and on the steering committee of the European Commission's Joint Action on Infectious Diseases. And our third guest is Dr. Nicoletta Polichek. Nicoletta is chair of HIV Scotland's Board of Trustees. She is an academic who specializes in policing and criminology, human rights legislation and human rights violations, migration studies, gender and sexuality studies, sex work, HIV AIDS and public health and the social impacts of epidemics and emergencies. So I'd like to thank our guest speakers for taking the time today for being here with us. Thank you very much. Um, before we go into each presentation, I'd like to take just a few minutes just to give a brief overview of today's session and what the Force 90 means. So the Force 90 looks specifically at health-related quality of life throughout the HIV care continuum. A little under a year ago, HIV Scotland held our Living Well 50 Plus seminar series, which delved into various themes, including health-related quality of life. The seminar aimed to inform innovative, forward-thinking solutions to the challenges people living with HIV experience. So Scotland has achieved some great milestones. We've exceeded the UNAIDS global 90-90-90 targets. Uh, so of the approximately 6,100 people living with HIV in Scotland today, 92% have been diagnosed. 98% of people diagnosed are, and attending HIV care are now receiving HIV treatment. And 95% of those on treatment have achieved viral suppression. This is an incredible achievement. But at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, Scotland has had to focus on the science side of things. This was necessary at the time, but now that treatment has evolved and advanced so much, we can now shift our focus and begin discussions around, around what quality of life means for people living with HIV. So we know that health health-related quality of life is central to the care and support of people living with HIV. And although we do have effective treatment to ensure that people living with HIV live a long and healthy life, attaining and maintaining a better quality of life remains a challenge for many people. So the big question is this, what do we mean by health-related quality of life? In order to help answer this question, we invited people living with HIV, NHS representatives, academics, and public and third sector organizations and ask them what quality of life meant to them and what were the main challenges they've encountered. So based on the discussions that we've had, the major, major concerns were firstly about managing multiple health concerns and comorbidities and of the negative effects of taking multiple medications. In the seminar, um, participants reported having difficulties managing their health and the effect it had on their everyday life. And in many cases, limiting limiting people's ability to access health services in order to attain better health outcomes. 
And secondly, the experiences of mental ill health, uh, such as depression and anxiety, can have a negative impact on health-seeking behaviors and, uh, and, of course, quality of life. There were some concerns brought forward about employment and HIV, about financial insecurities, of the experiences of stigma and discrimination in various settings, and not just in healthcare, and also of the experiences of social isolation and loneliness. So not dissimilar to physical health factors, these can also have a big impact on an individual's mental health, but can also significantly obstruct the ability to access services and attain a better health-related quality of life. So all of these together represent some of the major contributing factors that may lead to lower quality of life for people living with HIV. So the next question is then, what can we do to ensure that people living with HIV attain and maintain better health-related quality of life throughout their lives and across their uh, HIV care continuum? So in this session, we hope to dig a little deeper. And without further ado, I'm going to invite our first guest speaker, Dr. Megan Kahl. So over to you, Megan. I think you, if you have a, a, a presentation, you can screenshot it or share your screen or, or so forth. Thank you so much. Uh, no, I think I'm, today I'm just going to um, to speak, I think, uh, to, to the attendees. So thank you so much. Um, for inviting me here today to uh, talk to you about what I know about health-related quality of life for people with HIV um, and uh, share a little bit of information that um, we've collected at Public Health England um, uh, through the Positive Voices 2021 survey and as well as our, our plans for the future. Um, so I think whenever I talk about health-related quality of life, I think it's useful just to go back to, to the basic concept as a starting place, because I think we talk about um, health-related quality of life. It's, a, it's sort of like lingo now, and it's bandied about quite a, quite a lot. But I think we need to remember, what does this mean? And, and the concept itself is, is simply relating the, the idea that your health has an impact on your day-to-day -day life and the practical aspects of daily living in, uh, in terms of your function, how you function uh, physically, um, how you're able to do your normal activities, um, how you look after yourself. It can also have impacts on your mental health, your emotional health, um, and of course it can have impacts socially and wider um, within, within your environment. So, the idea of health-related quality of life is a way to, to measure that and add that into the metrics of how we monitor our, our health, not only restricting things like laboratory measures and, and other clinical measures, but understanding a more holistic view of our health. Um, and this is very much in line with um, the, the World Health Organization's view of how they define health. Um, which is not only looking at you know absence of disease, but it's also considering complete medical, medical sorry, physical, mental, and social well-being in terms of health. So, so where does that stand for HIV? Well, as we know, and, and as Jeff introduced uh, very nicely, you know we're moving into um, an era with HIV um, where uh, we have excellent treatment antiretrovirals that are highly effective, have quite minimal side effects. Um, people are virally suppressed um, and people are um, generally living well with their HIV. However, um, that doesn't mean that everybody is doing well um, and that we need to stop um, measuring and stop monitoring um, how people are doing because we know that there is a very strong um, social uh, element to HIV infection. There's still an incredible amount of stigma and discrimination going on. Um, we also know that we have an aging HIV population, um, particularly in the UK, um, and people are, are getting older with HIV. People are uh, acquiring more and more um, uh, non-communicable di non -communicable diseases and other comorbidities um, and living with those really for the first time. Um, so this is sort of the, the first generation of people with HIV who are living into really old age and, and having to experience um, multiple comorbidities. We also know that the NHS and the health systems are in evolution, they're changing. 
um, we're looking more towards integrated care. And is this potentially leaving HIV and HIV specialist services behind? Where do people stand when, when they are dealing with multiple chronic conditions, perhaps mental health and all that? Um, so there's, there's a lot going on that I think means that it's really, really important that we continue to monitor um, um, how people are doing. Now, what the other thing that's really in, interesting about health-related quality of life is that it is uh, by definition subjective and it's patient reported. Um, and so when we're talking about um, a monitoring, so and I work at Public Health England, so in terms of a monitoring and how we measure our health system response to HIV, the HIV epidemic, um, you know, including some, um, some reference to um, uh, Lot, patients' lives and their experience and bringing that to the fore rather than solely relying on bio, uh, clinical and biomedical metrics and how we monitor that response is also really, really important. And what it can also do is identify inequalities within the population. So this is my, was my sort of endorsement for why I think quality of life is really, really important. That said, there are a lot of challenges with measurement, um, uh, probably too much to go into now, but, um, uh, but there's no sort of consensus as it, as it were about how best to measure quality of life in people with HIV. Um, there is, um, I guess with, with uh, there's no um, set routine data collection um, that's sort of mandated by the NHS on quality of life for people with HIV. That said, there is um, some mandated quality of life um, measurement happening in other conditions, other chronic conditions. So perhaps it's about bringing that into HIV um, as, that, as, a, as a chronic condition that needs to be, um, needs some quality of life monitoring. Um, and yes, it is very condition dependent actually. So you can measure quality of life um, in a very general way in the, in the general population, but there are specific things around people's experience with HIV um, and, and the disease itself that um, perhaps needs some more specific, more in-depth um, measurement that needs to be encapsulated and what it is to live with, um, have good quality of life with HIV. So that said, um, I think I, I just want to um, talk very briefly about some of the work that we have done um, at Public Health England through the Positive Voices Survey to monitor quality of life. Um, so uh, for those who aren't familiar, Positive Voices is a national survey of people living with HIV. Um, in, it, it, it ran for the first time nationally in 2017, um, and it ran in England and Wales, um, and uh, it aimed to uh, sample, a nice representative sample of people living with HIV who are attending HIV clinics. Um, it, and in 2017, it achieved a response of 4,400 responses. Um, and one of the key measures within that survey was quality of life. Um, and we measured this in, in a couple of different ways. Um, one way we measured this was um, asking um, about people's, um, uh, how they would rate their health today. We also asked, also asked how people, uh, how satisfied people are with their life nowadays. So these are quite, you might call these global measures, just very general overviews. We also asked people um, about their quality of life using the EQ5D measure, which is a, um, a Eurocall quality of life um, um, uh, instrument scale. Um, which asks about five different domains around um, quality of life, looking at mobility, um, self-care, ability to do usual activities, and pain and discomfort, um, as well as anxiety and depression. And I think I'll focus on that just now because that was, um, I think, one of the more interesting areas um, in terms of where we are able to um, identify some disparities in people with HIV. So when we use that, that measure, we were able to compare to the general population. And when we did that, we found that people with HIV had double the rates of anxiety and depression compared to the general population. We also saw elevated rates of pain and discomfort, um, which given the, um, the actual actually younger overall age profile of people with HIV compared to the general UK population, um, 
is concerning. Um, and so, uh, yes, we, we also are planning to do um, an, another round of Positive Voices in 2021, which I want to mention. Um, and in this round, we, we would, if possible, like to include Scotland, of course, in that measurement so that we can have a UK-wide measure. We can have nation-level um, measures as well. Um, and in this round, we're going to uh, continue to measure quality of life and hopefully go into a bit more depth where we're able to look at HIV specific measures around quality of life um, so that we can better understand the, you know, the key issues and disparities in people with HIV. I think I might leave it there. Um, <laughs> if that's all right. Thank you very much, Megan. That was very informative. And uh, the information that you provided with the Positive Voices Survey has been fantastic. It's good that, that there is that kind of work going forward and that quality of life measurement is being uh, addressed, at least in England and Wales. I know in Scotland, there is no quality of life measurement quite yet, but we are looking at implementing something that could be a national surveillance system here in Scotland. But uh, like you said, there are obviously some challenges in initiating something like that. Um, thank you very much, Megan. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lavis, who will go into the Force 90. So, Jeffrey, off to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And let me um, share my screen. I'll just put up a few slides to, to guide um, my comments. And oddly, there we go. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm just going to introduce the fourth 90. It's a term we, we banter about. We've been discussing it since 2016, um, and we're moving closer and closer towards a common consensus definition of it and what Megan also mentioned, a, a metric so we can actually measure it moving forward. So in general, it's about quality of life, but it's about focusing on health-related quality of life to improve quality of life. We're working generally in the health sector. This is the kind of work through UNAIDS, WHO, ministries of health and welfare um, that, that can take on these kinds of measurements. So we have a big ask, but um, a more of a narrow uh, path to achieve it. So we're all familiar with the 390s and how important they were to guide the policy and research agendas for HIV care delivery, to help catalyze a coordinated global action, and they spurred significant progress on linkage to care, access to art, and viral suppression, though more work is needed to address these gaps. So when we talk about the fourth 90, we do have to remember that we haven't reached the 390s in all settings, including parts of Europe, and even in countries where, that, is, that claim to have achieved the 390s, sometimes we hear that particular populations have not achieved those 390s. And when I hear you've reached 390s, I say, what about 395s? We want to get as close as possible to diagnosing everyone with HIV, getting them on treatment, and then moving towards this fourth 90. Not really then moving, but at the same time moving. Why at the same time? Let me explain. Well, people living with HIV are aging. That's the good news. The medicine works. People are living a longer life. But that also means that they're at higher risk of multimorbidity, having HIV and at least two comorbidities at the same time. Aging people will have more comorbidities. Those with HIV have a greater risk at having more comorbidities and having those comorbidities at an earlier age. Discrimination is still rife. Hard to believe that we're still talking about stigma and discrimination 30 years after identifying or 40 years after identifying HIV. Discrimination is very concrete. It's, it's illegal. So we can identify it and we can end it. And that's why we often talk about discrimination in the context of the fourth 90, but we know that stigma foments discrimination and discrimination in turn leads to more stigma. So when we talk about discrimination, we're also talking about stigma. And here I won't go through it, you know, just you see the levels of reported discrimination in a whole range of countries, you know, from 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% of people reporting having felt that they were discriminated against. So the fourth 90. So here you have the 390s as UNAIDS, 
set them out. So each time it's 90% of the previous. So 90% of everyone living with HIV is diagnosed. 90% of them are on treatment. 90% of them are on virally suppressed. That means 73% of people living with HIV are virally suppressed. That's not good enough, but it, it's a good goal. It's also a goal from five years ago, which is why UNAIDS is in the midst of re, re, um, redefining or redeveloping a, a, a new global strategy. There'll be a program um, board meeting in the next couple of weeks. There'll be, there's been a series of focus group discussions and we're hoping that UNAIDS will take on board key elements of the fourth 90, this good health related quality of life that encompasses the three other 90s. It's not just for those who are virally suppressed. It means addressing comorbidities, addressing discrimination, addressing health related quality of life in everyone living with HIV. Here at the bottom, you see where we launched this idea. Um, well, now a little over four years ago, and we called it Beyond Viral Suppression of HIV, the new quality of life frontier. And we're so excited that that's being taken up. And thank you very much to HIV Scotland for, um, for really highlighting this issue during your summit. So one of the things we're doing now is we're, we're, we're holding a, a global consensus process to try and get agreement on what this fourth 90 target is the target relating to long-term care of people living with HIV. We need to strategically support health systems in improving long-term care outcomes. So all HIV stakeholders need a clear shared understanding of what the fourth 90 represents. And as Megan said, how progress towards the fourth 90 should be measured. So for now, we can all kind of go our own way as long as we're going in the same direction, but we do wanna move us along the same path. So just like the 390s are so comparable that they have their challenges as Megan uh, can tell us and how reporting is carried out, we wanna make sure the 490 is in there too because we think that that's gonna define the paradigm for people living with HIV moving forward unless they reach immortality. Right now, a long life as long as anyone else. So what are we gonna do with this consensus statement? We're, we're having various round consensus making rounds called Delphi rounds. And we hope to publish the statement in July, 2021 in time for the next big AIDS conference. So we can discuss it there also at the same time, the UN AIDS strategy should be out. We wanted to find the HIV fourth 90 and the constituent measurable elements. We want global and national health system monitoring to be modified to better reflect progress on HIV 490 targets. And it looks like Scotland, England, some of the Western European countries might be leading the way, but this is a 490 that should be globally accepted and globally used. And finally, we want global, regional, national, and subnational stakeholders to be guided in pursuing the strategic goals that will optimize long-term care outcomes for people living with HIV, including non-clinical outcomes. This is going beyond viral suppression. You're living a long life, therefore it's not just about HIV, it's not just about your antiretroviral therapy, it's about how you're living, it's about quality of life issues as well, even though our focus will be more narrowly on health-related quality of life. So back in 2016, we thought of really it was two domains, comorbidities, often defined by the clinicians, they, they diagnose you with a comorbidity, and self-related, health-related quality of life that can be reported by people living with HIV. Then there were discussions saying, well, you know, um, self-related, health-related quality of life encompasses other issues. So it's not just comorbidities, it's really multi-morbidity. So it's having HIV and more, two or more comorbidities. It's about that self-related HRQOL, but it's also about discrimination. And now there's discussions about how do we consider, how do we incorporate issues like frailty, disability, the concept of healthy aging, and what other paradigms might we want to consider? We can take that up um, in the Q&A. So let me really just stop there um, and we can move to our, to our third speaker because I'm really interested in having um, the conversation with everyone on you know, how do we define this, this fourth 90? What does it mean to you, particularly those of you living with HIV, but also people working in the health system? How can we measure it? And how can we come back in a year and say, well, this is how we're doing on achieving that fourth 90? Thank you.
Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, that was really great uh, introduction and clear and pointed overview of like stigma and discrimination in the fourth 90 as well. Uh, it's clear that different key populations experience different challenges and how to specifically address these is going to be uh, incredibly important going forward. And I hope that will, there will be a robust discussion today. Um, I'd like to introduce Nicoletta Polichek. Um, I am going to share my screen as I have heard. PowerPoint, let me see. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that um, my uh, my talk uh, follows really well uh, from what other speakers have said before, because my key question is whose quality of life? And I think that uh, my key concern is still very much when we think about uh, um, quality of life, we have in mind uh, a kind of stereotypical population group. So what I'm, I'm trying, I'm hoping to do with my, my talk today is sort of dissect and offer you some sort of snapshot on uh, different population groups that are always uh, or often much more marginalized. If we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, already we have said that um, quality of life is multidimensional. And I want to argue also um, that the margin is never shared space. And although um, when we think about and we talk about quality of life, uh, we talk about uh, a general understanding of quality of life. There are so many different uh, layers um, of quality of life. And specifically, I want to try and challenge the notion of quality of life, uh, which is a, a discourse which is very much within a clinical and research settings. And I still want to kind of highlight the importance of asking people in so many people living with HIV um, in so many different ways, what is the quality of their life, our own life? Next slide, please. So quality of life is person dependent and means different things to different people. Okay, not dying, which is already a great achievement in terms of quality of life, obviously, it does not mean that, that people living with HIV are living to their full, to the fuller potential. But uh, my question, my key question is what about stigma? Irrespectively of the good quality of people living with HIV, stigma is still, is still lingering. And this is what I want to, to address. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so I want to briefly, um, well, as briefly as I can, uh, share something about a study I have conducted not long ago about the, the HIV clinic, uh, which I have uh, intended as the site of the production of situated knowledges and by HIV clinic uh, as the site of situated knowledges, I understand the knowledge of us living with HIV and then those who know about HIV from a different perspective, i.e. the sort of healthcare and social care perspective. So uh, this study was very much about notions of place, space and safety, and safety within the HIV clinic. And I have identified some themes which you have the opportunity to see highlighted here. But in particular, for the purpose of this brief conversation, I think it's important that uh, we stress that um, the way in which rights and citizenship rights are uh, uh, embedded into discourses about quality of life and also the HIV space as safe space, HIV space being the HIV clinic. An HIV place, uh, again the HIV clinic, removed from, uh, from visibility. My research questions were about uh, um, the place of personal life within the HIV clinic, the place of work, some of us work, but some of us do not work, they aspire to work or they're not able to work. And consequently, where is the place of care within the space of the HIV clinic? And I have identified particularly a population group which to, to me is very much uh, underrepresented, uh, which is, um, well, first of all, women. And within women, I have identified sex workers as a population group which uh, have less agency and less voice. Next slide, please. 
So my study was about uh, 87 participants uh, who self-identified as women. As you can see here, there's quite interesting data, but the, the key point for the purpose of uh, this conversation today is that out of 87 participants, only 10 people were willing to disclose their HIV status outside the confinement of the social and healthcare setting, which means that in terms of quality of life, we still have quite a lot to do or quite a lot of, quite a lot of discussion needs to be done. Um, I want to identify, if you can move to the next slide, please, some key issues uh, which were highlighted in this study. There is a clear disparity between the way in which healthcare practitioners and women live with HIV relate to women who are sex workers who have been tested to, to HIV. And in the, the following slides, which I'm going to show you in a minute, there are some interesting quotes from, um, from the participants. It's also that interesting for me that is irrelevant, uh, it's not important at all, that for um, social and healthcare practitioners, uh, it doesn't really matter what is the work that women do, but it's, it appears to be fundamental and making a difference in terms of quality of life and perception of quality of life amongst women who are living with HIV who are not engaged in, in sex work. So there are still underlying discourses about stigma, discrimination and blame. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of questioning identities, which is the core of uh, living a good quality of life, I think that there are quite a lot of interesting uh, points here. But I think that um, I quite um, like, uh, for a better word, uh, the, the third quote among these three. Um, I'm not like them, end of story. I am majorly positive, but I am not a prostitute which tells quite a lot about quality of life and perception of quality of life. If we can move to the next one, please. I think, again, it's very interesting here to start thinking about uh, sexual identity politics uh, and also the landscape, the landscape being still the HIV clinic, but whose landscape are we referring to in terms of quality of life? And what I think that it became apparent in um, in my study is that there is almost a, a sense of uh, um, uh, willing to belong to, to a specific landscape, but in a way, uh, in order to belong to a specific landscape and being safe and uh, affording a good quality of life, uh, we, and I mean we in a very general term, anyone who is living with HIV, irrespectively of gender, sexuality, age, race, and everything has to obey to some uh, preconceived ideas and rules in a way in which um, I think is similar to um, internalize some sort of good conduct. So my study showed very well that, um, and I hope I will have more time in the discussion to, to, to clarify this, that um, according to sense of self-identity and the perception of others, then there is difference, a big difference in terms of uh, the quality of life. If we can move to the next slide, please. Quality of life, um, again, is the HIV space as the clinic as a safe space. And again, I want to point the attention to some of the quotes that I um, selected here. The second one says they're judging you and staring at you, referring a, a place which should be a non-judgmental place by definition. And it's about uh, creating different clusters of discrimination and stigma within a place which I want to stress is supposed or allegedly is safe. Next slide again, please. So the HIV uh, place, again, my study uh, was looking at uh, the really the, the clinic, the HIV clinic as removed from visibility and what does it mean in terms of quality life? Do we want to have the HIV clinic embedded within a hospital setting or scattered around other wards? So it's quite interesting again that some of the, um, the, the quotes that I selected here are kind of telling us that uh, um, in particular uh, I still haven't told people I know that I have HIV, and the only reason here is because I have to. That's quite interesting because then uh, the same quote later on talks about 
I don't want to see to be seen, sorry, near a junkie or a prostitute. Again, reiterating some ideas uh, which I have already explained. Next slide, please. Okay, negotiating identities is about claiming quality of life. According to who you are and you are perceived to be, then quality of life can be better or worse. And this is a kind of ongoing process. It's a never ending story. I can quickly move because I'm aware of time to the next slide, which is kind of uh, going towards the concluding remark. So uh, I very briefly, um, I hope I managed to demonstrate the margin where we live. It's never shared place, shared place. There is always, always uh, at the margin. So quality of life has clearly different meanings for different people, but also quality of life is almost uh, an aspiration for some people. And conversation with sex workers living with HIV have highlighted really clearly, really well, how stigma, stigmatization are closely linked to the reproduction of inequality and exclusion, making the quality of life pretty miserable. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta. That was really informative. Um, it's unfortunate that the experiences of stigma is still, like Jeffrey Lazarus was saying, like rife, and it is obviously um, can have uh, an impact on people's ability to to access better quality of life. Um, and one of the stats that that came out of me is like ten out of the 80, 87 people were just willing to disclose. That's just unfortunately in, 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 a, in an era where we're supposed to be like a little more progressive and be understanding of like that HIV is no longer a death sentence. People can live long and healthy lives as well. So thank you very much for that presentation, Nicoletta. We have a couple questions that I like to pose to the to our guest speakers. Uh, the first one, Nicoletta, might be a good one for you to answer. How might activists or third sector organizations empower people living with HIV to want to be open with their status. Is this about more than empowerment and more about changing societal views? Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, uh, actually, I don't think it's about empowerment because empowerment means that we don't have power. Um, but actually, we do have power. It's just that power has been taken away. So I think that most communities living with HIV have been disenfranchised for too long. So it's not about uh, um, having the layer of now reacquiring power that we always had. It's a bit like, uh, you know, we always had a voice. Is that sometimes our voices? Uh, um, and I have referred to this in many different instances. Our voices has been there all the time. It's always here. Just sometimes there are other voices who shout louder in so many different contexts. I also think uh, that is maybe quite controversial. It's not, it's not everyone living with HIV should be an activist. I think that um, it would be ideal if us living with HIV, we didn't even have to talk about HIV because there is no stigma attached to living with HIV. There is no discrimination, so we can talk about something else. So paradoxically, it's not that we have to be activists. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making it <laughs> much sense. Let's draw this closer to, to quality of life then. Like how, how the concept of, of empowerment, how does that then kind of give agency in order to attain a better quality of life? Uh, again, I think that the issue of empowerment is quite a, a complex issue. I think that, um, well, uh, I think as a scholar, as a feminist, as a critical feminist, I've, I've, I've struggled with uh, the notion, but I don't want to give a lecture, I've struggled with the notion of uh, empowering empowerment as something who is almost an enlightenment given to us from elsewhere. I think that we are all in a position that uh, power, um, if power is what we want, I think we don't need power. I think that we need to kind of make sure, I'm using the word revolution in a very inverted commas. Uh, um, I think that we can uh, revolutionize the way in which we talk about HIV and communities. The simple fact that there is always a kind of a middle class, quite affluent uh, um, 
person who can speak openly about the status means that behind that person, there are so many people who are disenfranchised, whose quality of life is pretty poor, but they also live in uh, terror. Some of the women I have met through my research, which happens to be around HIV, but also in other settings, migrant women, so women who are stateless, women who are at the margin of society do not have power, they don't need and they are not looking for power. They're also looking for um, others who are already in power to be aware of their suffering. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question. So uh, from so this question might be best posed to Jeffrey. Uh, HIV Scotland are planning to roll out a pilot of the POSQUAL, so positive quality of life uh, methodology within Glasgow, which could lead to a national measurement. How do we make sure that governments, policymakers, and healthcare professionals take quality of life measurements seriously for people living with HIV? when they might say, we take quality of life of everyone seriously. Well, I think, I think when you can compare, when you can show studies that demonstrate that people living with HIV have a lower quality of life, then they need to focus on, on that population. So POSQUAL, uh, which Megan and I have just used um, in Spain and, and Romania, and it was developed in Australia, it is a great HIV focused um, quality, you know, HRQOL, instrument for people living with HIV, um, but it can also be useful to do something like what Megan mentioned with EQ5D5L, just to, to compare the general population to people living with HIV. So, but at any rate, when you have that POSQUAL data, you can also compare it to, to other countries to see how the Scottish population living with HIV um, is doing, and you can see which domains people are doing, are doing worse in, and, you know, start to triangulate it with other available um, data in the country. That's that's great. One of the questions that I've been meaning to ask is like, how are we? How can we ensure that priority populations are reached uh, in this type of data collection, like POSQUAL or the the methodology that Megan was saying with with her positive voices survey? Yeah. So I'll I'll make a short comment and then punt to, to Megan. I mean, but but really, this is where the community plays a key role. You have to have your community activists. I mean, Nicoletta, you said everyone doesn't have to be an HIV activist, but it would be great if everyone would, would fill in these surveys so we know, you know how you're doing. And that means um, really through a snowballing process, collaborating with groups that work with sex workers, groups that work with migrants, people inject drugs, et cetera. And of course, you know, you're, you're, yourselves as HIV Scotland have a huge network, but it's gonna require outreach and in some cases, I don't know if this is methodologically wrong, Megan can tell me, but um, I mean, you may have to help people, not, not with their answers, but you may have to, to read the questions to them. You might have to explain things. Um, you know, some people won't, won't have that ability to, to answer those, those few questions in Pasqual. Can I say something? Sorry, I didn't mean I think that it would be important to involve uh, people living with HIV in the design of research, so that maybe it would be easier for them to kind of take part in the research, because otherwise all research studies are done on us. So it's all very well for me because I'm an academic and I'm a professor, so it's slightly different, but we, we will never reach population, population groups who don't have voices if we launch a research study on today. We need to embrace them. We need to speak the language. I just want to kind of sorry. Yeah, I, I agree. But I mean, you know, if we have, I mean, Pasqual has now been developed through a, through a very long process. So I think the next step is then to, to run a study partnering with groups, people living with HIV and groups that represent those, you know, greatly affected. Because otherwise you're going to put this survey out there and people aren't going to answer. You have to create a Bit of a groundswell to say now is a chance to say this is how we're doing um you know there's been studies that show in some settings certain groups of hiv are doing just as well as everyone else and that's fantastic um then there'll be other issues we need to to to, to address because they may live in a country that has discriminatory laws on on the books or something else that needs to be addressed that's why those domains are, are so interesting to compare megan i don't know if you want to add anything since this is yeah. your domain. <laughs> yeah, the, me the methodology stuff. Um, I mean, what I could say is what's worked uh, very, very well for the Positive Voices survey is to run the studies actually in the HIV clinics um, and recruited by 
the HIV clinical staff. Um, and I think that's very, very much speaks to the point of, of Nicoletta's presentation, actually, which is that um, many people still do not disclose their HIV status outside of a, of a healthcare setting. Um, many people, um, yeah, I think don't access community organizations, actually. It doesn't mean that they're not in need as well. So um, I think going to where people are is really key. Then once you're there, you need to make the survey as accessible as possible. And that means multiple, multiple modes of questionnaire. So not just an online questionnaire because that'll only reach a certain sector. Also not just a paper questionnaire because that only reaches a certain sector of people. Um, you know, trying to make it as accessible, translations if possible. And I think depending on the topic area, but actually HRQOL, these questionnaires are, are, are usually okay to be uh, um, filled in with assistance from somebody else. It could be somebody at, you know, they could be recruited in the clinic. They could go home and fill it out. They could have somebody, you know, help them. They could have a care worker help them. So I think it's just making it as accessible as possible. That's really key. And again, another, just another piece of learning from running the Positive Voices survey um, is some clinics where um, perhaps they were having trouble um, getting particularly women involved in the survey. So women are just, oh, I don't have time. I don't, I don't, I don't know what this is. And I don't know if I trust Public Health England. I don't know if I, I know what that is. But then I think it's, you know, what the, what the clinical staff and was saying is if you don't speak, if you don't participate, then your voice is silent and nobody hears you and the things that are, are, are affecting you, your unmet needs and your experience. So, you know, it's a bit of altruism perhaps to get people to participate because otherwise the people, only the people who shout loud enough and, and are, are, you know, the, the, the most vocal end up having their needs heard and perhaps not the more marginalized. So getting that understanding that this data can actually be used to help you and make services that are useful for you, um, integrate your care better, that's the key. Uh, right. But then it also means the researcher has to stand up to their promise that it will, they will try to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. I think also as key is like confidentiality and making sure that everything's anonymous and having those multiple modes of, of, of dissemination of a survey such as this one is definitely important to ensure that we get a wide scope and the data is collected. Um, which brings us to the next question um, by an attendee. Like, what do you think integrated care looks like for people aging with HIV? And this is a good question because then it looks at like, how do health systems need to adapt uh, in order to expand uh, services that look and address uh, quality of life as well? So um, Megan, since if you wanna try to take a stab at this one, and then we'll go through the panel. Well, I can start, but I, I, I mean, I would definitely know this is Jeff's <laughs> domain. Okay, yeah. um, but um, I think I can start only in that I, I can speak to the fact that from, again, from the Positive Voices survey, we, we did like a comprehensive needs assessment within that. And it became very, very clear that a, a key part of integrated care is not just about the comorbidities, but also the social care aspects, um, peer support, um, um, help dealing with loneliness and isolation. So I think um, from a health system and not just the health system, but I think it's also integrating the social and care system so that people's uh, holistic needs are met. I'll stop there and pass over to Jeff who can probably speak more. Thanks Megan, yeah, yeah we got those two questions backwards. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, what is integrated care gonna look like? It's gonna look like you're virally suppressed and you're not going to see your HIV doctor anymore. You're going to see your primary care physician, your GP, because you have general health problems. Um, they'll take your blood, they'll check your CD4 cell count, your viral load according to, to guidelines. It may be more along the Australian model where certain GPs have had some extra training and also get some extra funding um, or payments to, to see people living with HIV, but you, but you do this through the GP and the GP makes an assessment if you should be referred on. Because right now when you go to an HIV doctor and the HIV doctors are incredible and they know everything about infectious diseases, but you have other issues that you're facing that, that, that it doesn't make sense to use an, an, an ID doctor, an infectious disease doctor's time. They may not have um, you know, the expertise in, in dealing with those issues the way a GP does who's seeing common um, um, ailments and, and conditions all the time. So integrated care is gonna look a little differently. It's gonna 
start to move through primary care for those who are virally suppressed and leaving those who you know who need extra specialist care to go there. And when and where systems are slow to make that change, which is really most health systems um, for now, um, people living with HIV will go to their infectious disease doctors and along with the community, we really need to start providing better referrals, not just referrals to other clinical specialties, but referrals to um, social welfare. Um, I'm having trouble with housing. I'm, I'm, having, I'm having these symptoms. I'm having trouble with employment. We will need simple things, posters, pamphlets, not just the sort of traditional comorbid conditions that, that, would, that a doctor would then refer you to, but the bigger beyond viral suppression issues that people living with HIV face. So you can go through your GP and to a specialist or at your specialist link out um, to other areas and other areas that traditionally we haven't linked to. I mean, no one goes to the ID doctor and picks, I don't think, and really picks up pamphlets, you know, and information about, about all of these other issues, but they're real issues that face people and they can, and we know, and it's documented that they can impact on clinical outcomes, particularly when adherence is impacted because you have a lower um, quality of life because of other things going on around you, like, um, like discrimination. I agree. I think one, one of the things that um, some of the surveys that we've conducted have shown that it'd be easier for a lot of people living with HIV to have one point of contact, whether it's a GP or the HIV specialist clinic, uh, that then kind of helps uh, refer them to their care team as opposed to having to go individually to each, like your, whether your mental health service or your, your social support or what, what have you. So having that kind of one point of contact would be beneficial. Um, we have one question, Nicoletta, you might be able to answer this. How do we ensure a society where women are willing to be more open about their HIV status? And this has come from uh, one of the participants in our... How do we ensure, sorry, I didn't catch. No, uh, how do we ensure a society where women are willing to be open about their status? Um, I think it's not about uh, women's uh, status, as in HIV status. I think it's about women's status in society, because um, women, uh, in most instances, have less agency, less power. And I use power in, uh, you know, with kind of inverted commas almost. So it's just about uh, reconstructing uh, patriarchal societies, uh, which will take. Uh, just a little bit longer than just thinking about HIV. HIV, um, and for women living with HIV, um, discrimination is part of a much wider um, problem because let's face it, in society, unless you are uh, um, willing to take risk, risks about your own status and being open, People will discriminate and will take uh, children away from you, will discriminate when it comes to employment, will make value judgments. Uh, you heard from my study, which is uh, um, quite a significant study for Scotland anyway, because it's 87 people. Women living with HIV are discriminating against uh, sex workers living with HIV. So it's a much more complex, um, and I wish I had um, you know, the tools for, um, for change in society. But I think that, you know, small steps are very important steps. And I think by allowing platforms for women to, to talk more and recognizing that there are not only white middle-class women who are living with HIV, there are so many other women who are living with HIV who are not allowed to speak because they live in fear. That's quite important. And I think that's when we can change. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> Um, I, I might, I'm mindful of the time. Um, I've been told to say that we have the next session at 4.30 is on optimizing prep. And I do encourage anybody who's listening to this session to, to, to view it. It's going to be a very good session. Um, there is one last question then on our, our Q&A. And it's, it asks, is there data on rates of depression reported by people living with HIV in England, uh, deferring depending on any comorbidities that they might have. So like the association between comorbidities and the rates of depression in England. So Megan, you might be able to, to answer that one. Uh, yep, yeah. so um, 
again, back to the positive voices data. Um, yeah, we did see a, a correlation between um, uh, worse mental health and increased burden of comorbidities. And by that, I mean the number of, of, of chronic health conditions that people are living with. Um, I think I think a key thing is is perhaps it may not be having a comorbidity, but how well those other comorbidities are being managed and dealt with and handled. Um, and um, we see we see, for example, a really really strong correlation. I mean, it's very unsurprising, but between um, a depression um, and pain, so symptoms of pain and discomfort. Um, that people may be living with day in and day out. And that could be due to peripheral neuropathy. It could be due to arthritis, our bone and joint disease. Um, it, it could be due to any number of, of different conditions that people are living with. So um, yeah, to answer the question, we do have that data and it does exist. There is, does seem to be sort of this clustering effect of mental health and other comorbidities. They don't exist in silos and separate to one another. Um, yeah, and in, in dealing with the symptoms of those comorbidities as well. Again, um, given that we have four minutes left, I'll open it up to our speakers. If there's anything that you'd like to to include in the session, please please be free. Feel free to do so. Oh, let me just just thank you again, Jeff and, and Nathan and everyone at, at HIV Scotland. I assume on, on on behalf of the panelists, but you should you should feel free to, to chime in with any words you want to say. I just think it's great that Scotland is really driving this agenda forward. I mean, in September we met and talked about you know health related quality of life. Now we're talking about the fourth ninety. You're sharing you know what you're doing in, in Glasgow and Pasqual. Um, it's a lot of people on on the on the line, and I really hope um, you know we can continue the conversation because it's going to take you know national champions, countries. Um, you know, to, to drive this agenda forward. So, so one last message for, for Scotland, for both HIV Scotland and your authorities is, um, you know, push this forward, um, you know, through the UNAIDS channels, through your representatives at the World Health Organization, because we can fight from, from the bottom as, as researchers and, and activists and, and, and people in the community and so on. Um, but, but you have, a, I think, a unique opportunity um, in Scotland from, from what I know about your government to, to really um, you know, push this at the highest levels and, and also ally yourselves with, with other countries that are championing um, issues for people living with HIV, issues around quality of life um, for everyone. Thank you. And let's get Scotland on board for the next round of Positive Voices. <laughs> Fantastic, we're, we're, we're welcome and willing. Yeah, um, yeah I agree with Jeffrey. Um, it's about the collaboration and the partnership between all sectors across Scotland in order to like uh, advance the HIV response, which is why what we're doing the Fast Track City Summit, um, it's just a first step to ensure that uh, quality of life is addressed for, for everybody living with HIV. And then that, importantly, that stigma and discrimination is, is kind of like, we got to get to zero. Um, yeah. Anybody else have any other any other uh, comments? No. No. All right. Thank you very much uh, for attending. This brings our session to a close at four thirty. In two minutes, we'll have the optimizing prep session, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.